Last week I saw a comment on YouTube by a woman who asked why medications were so expensive and if there could be state laboratories who could manufacture the medications to bring the price down. Earlier this week I attended a meeting, an online meeting in Boston about these sorts of developments and decided to make a video about it and I'll explain why I have a personal stake in this, several personal stakes in fact. Okay, so first let me tell you that I too have always had this idea, well maybe not always, that pharmaceutical companies are bad, that big pharma is bad. That's not necessarily true. In that meeting on uh, Tuesday, in that meeting in Boston, I heard it said that it takes 10 to 15 years to develop a medication. I believe that because first there's the research, which as a scientist I know can take a long time. And then you have the clinical trials, the phases of the clinical trials, and then you have the FDA approval or the approval in other countries that you need to go through. And that takes time and it takes a lot of money. It often takes one to two billion US dollars, they said, and that's actually probably true. Let me give you three examples of companies that I've been looking at or developments that I've been looking at, I should say. I have an interest in bioethics and that forces me to take an interest in medications as well. That sounds very negative, that's not how I mean it. And I have a second interest in that as well, as it turns out, but I wasn't aware of that yet when all of this began. So let me read something that I've become aware of. On the 4th of August, 2023, the FDA, that's in the United States, approved Zurzuve, Zuronolone. That's the first pill that treats postpartum depression, also called postnatal depression. I was aware that that FDA approval was in the works. It sounded great, right? This was a development by Sage Therapeutics with Biogen. But what happened? Their stock tanked, that is Sage Therapeutics stock, by something like 50%, I think they went from 40 to 20, something like that, or below 20 even. And why is that? It's because people had hoped that the FDA would also grant approval for use for major depressive disorder, and it didn't do that. So this company lost half of its value because it didn't get a, an approval that it wasn't actually really seeking. It was developing something for postpartum depression, and that's serious enough. But of course, it's something that affects women, and anything that affects women isn't always valued as highly as something that values males, or even white males. Then there's a Bluebird Bio that develops exclusively CRISPR medications. It had gained permission to use one of its medications in the EU, but withdrew its permit, its marketing permit, if that's what you want to call it, because it wasn't able to negotiate a price. If pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, were that intent on making money, you would say that they would drop the price in such a way that they would still be making money. But developing CRISPR medications is so expensive and the treatment itself is so expensive that they have very little leeway. This picture of why medications are so expensive is pretty complicated. In the United States you have something called PBMs, Pharmacy Benefit Managers, and it sounds like it's people but it's not, it's companies. They negotiate prices on behalf of all the parties involved. It's different in the EU. So first of all, these companies need to get their investment back. They need to keep their investors happy. If they don't do well, their investors pull back because they need a heck of a lot of funding just to be able to develop these medications. If you need one to two billion just to develop one medication, then you better well have really good results. Otherwise, the investors go somewhere else because they just want money. Most investors, not all, just want money. 
There are, of course, also idealistic investors or ethical investors who only invest in companies that they feel are doing something good. Another issue with Bluebird Bio is that there is another company called Vertex that works with CRISPR AG Therapeutics, and they developed something similar. And because they are much bigger, they tend to get mentioned a lot, whereas Bluebird Bio the Bluebird Bio, the recent uh, Bluebird Bio medication that received uh, FDA approval on, off the top of my head, the 8th of December, along with the one for Vertex and CRISPR therapeutics for sickle cell disease, gets mentioned, and the one for Bluebird Bio does not get mentioned a lot. There is also the fact that the Bluebird Bio medication is much more expensive and that it has a so-called black box warning because there is a side effect, a potential side effect that's pretty damn serious. But it's my understanding that, that this side effect only showed up in earlier formulations of this treatment. So it may not actually apply for the current medication. But of course, in these things, you better err on the side of safety. So the FDA put a so-called black box warning on it, a black box label, which doesn't help. And of course, this stock too tanked ridiculously because this company is desperate for money to just stay alive, to keep doing its thing. And in order to be able to do that, it put out a share offering at a ridiculously low price. And that made the stock tank too. These companies have a hell of a fight for survival. Many of them don't survive. Many of these biotech companies put in a heck of a lot of effort and just simply don't survive. So it's not that easy to say that medications are expensive because big pharma is bad. It's more complicated than that. Then there is a different story that I ran in, and this is making me emotional, sorry. Um, and I can't help that. <laughs> On the 31st of October 2023, they said that they were discontinuing this medication, its development, because in the third phase clinical trial, the medication wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And then I realized that they were developing something else because they just in January announced, or actually in January, I realized that they announced that they were starting a 15 patient study and I looked into this and I thought why did they actually pause this earlier uh, earlier that year I think I think it was this year yes they did received a big grant from the NIH off the top of my head and they hadn't done anything with that yet and then I saw that they had paused the development of that drug just so that they, drug is not the right word, just so that they could put all its efforts into the development of the other medication, the one that they just decided to continue because it wasn't successful. So these companies take a very big risk. If you have to discontinue a successful trial development because you're developing something else and you have to make choices, that has to be heartbreaking. So I looked into this, what it was for exactly, and I thought, I haven't heard of this yet. These were so-called malodorous breast cancer tumors. I learned about a form of cancer that I wasn't aware of. It's called cutaneous metastatic breast cancer. I looked into it because I read in a brochure that they could be infectious and smell badly. That sounded pretty bad. And then I found a review paper in the Journal of Surgical Oncology. And I actually wish uh, to some degree that I hadn't because this is just as bad as it sounds. Cancer patients are having a hard enough time as it is and to have these particular tumors that's heartbreaking and i have a personal stake in that because this concerns breast cancer and my mother developed breast cancer shortly after my birth sort of 
and it was dismissed as a swollen milk gland. And later, after it had metastasized pretty badly, she was sent to physiotherapy, physical therapy. But the stuff was in her bones and she came home in so much pain. I sat there seeing my mother powerlessly in so much pain. I've gone with her to the hospital for her cobalt radiation therapy. She passed away when I was 14 and she'd been in so much pain for so long. And one of her breasts was amputated and the wound wouldn't close. So I cannot help but wonder if my mother was also being plagued by these particular tumors. I don't know, because in these days we didn't really talk much about medications and illnesses and so on. But my mother talked with me, so I know actually more about my mother's condition than people were aware of. My dad didn't. My dad thought that I didn't even know that my mother had breast cancer or cancer in the first place. So... This was not talked about in those days. Cancer wasn't mentioned. It was called C or K in my mother tongue. So when I saw what this company was doing, and this is really ridiculous, but it makes me so emotional, I realized that if they are successful, this is going to make such a huge difference for many cancer patients that I'm really hoping that they're going to be successful. <laughs> this is crazy, but this makes me really emotional. I, if that strikes you as strange, I was very much alone with my mother's suffering. Nobody is ever willing to talk about it in my family. Everything in my family has always been pushed under the carpet. And I just realized that I still have some heartache. There. I didn't cry for about seven years. And then I read about somebody else's passing due to cancer and I cried and cried and cried and wrote that woman a letter. That was in uh, when I was 22 or something like that. This is still a sore spot, so obviously my family doesn't talk about anything whatsoever. They've never talked about anything. Uh, my dad was hopeless. He couldn't deal with my mother's illness at all. And I was the one who was keeping the family together, basically. I used to go to the pharmacy and get my mother's sort of chemotherapy. It came in glass ampoules that were not only, of course, uh, fragile but the medication itself was not very stable either and I sometimes had to tell the pharmacy people that the medication had gone bad because I knew by then it would start flocculating or crystallizing I think flocculating it's been a long time I am perhaps the only one in my family who even knew that I don't know nobody's ever talked about my mother's passing or my mother's illness it's all been pushed on the carpet we weren't supposed to talk about that at all. But my mother talked with me about that and she told me that the stuff that she was getting, an IV that was administered at home would suppress her white cell blood count. Um, and I don't know which white cells in these days, maybe they didn't even know which cells there were. And if that white count dropped too low, then they had to stop the therapy the infusions with that medication until her white blood count got up enough. And she also had tumors on her vocal cords. And she said that if she'd been a teacher, she would have needed surgery on her vocal cords as well. I may be the only person who knows that because I don't know whether my mother had anyone to talk with. She had a good close sister that she talked with a lot, but all of a sudden she passed away due to cancer too. There was one afternoon when this sister of my mother's, my aunt, arrived and told her that she'd just been to hospital. She was, she'd taken the bus to hospital. Uh, she'd been diagnosed with cancer and she passed away very shortly after. And in the meantime, one of my mother's brothers was also diagnosed with cancer. This was also kept a secret. He had a brain tumor. It wasn't talked about at all. It was kept a big secret because it was inoperable. 
and he passed away after my mother's death, not that long after my mother's death. So after my mother's sister passed away, I'm not so sure whether my mother still had anyone to talk with, actually. <sighs> yeah, and this is something that ticks me off too. I know from reading here and that there that cancer patients sometimes get very badly otherwise. Cancer is not a fun topic. A lot of people want their friends to be fun, to be people to go out with and to have dinners with and to have good times with. And as soon as something bad happens, people disappear. And cancer is one of those things that makes people disappear. Pain medication apparently carries a big stigma to be what makes people disappear because of the opioid crisis in the United States. That wasn't an issue yet when my mother developed cancer. And I'm not aware of any people who abandoned my mother because she developed cancer. But it wasn't talked about. It just wasn't talked about at all. So crazy. I'm pleased that it's talked about more these days, but it still happens that a lot of people just abandon cancer patients because they don't want to deal with it. Sometimes it's very definite rejection of the cancer patient, and sometimes it's because people just don't know what to say anymore, and their awkwardness makes them stay away because they feel they're doing more harm than good. Yeah. <sighs> 